today and to all the Black Caucus members who stand behind me. Georgia has a chance to dramatically increase access to health coverage and to improve the lives of hundreds of thousands of Georgians by expanding Medicaid. Uninsured veterans, low-income parents, and other working-age adults in Georgia would benefit the most since they are most likely to be uninsured than any other age group. The Affordable Health Care Act in it, Medicaid aims to extend Medicaid coverage to most low-income people. Specifically, beginning in 2014, the ACA expands Medicaid eligibility to 130% of the federal poverty level. More than one quarter of working-age Georgians went without health care coverage in 2011. Approximately 27% of Georgians between the ages of 18 and 64 went without coverage last year. Now, the governor has refused to accept this money. Not to accept this money is to provide unnecessary human suffering. Those Georgians who are being denied health care because of the governor's rejection of federal tax dollars is unfair to those who have earned this coverage. This is not the governor's money to refuse. This is not some type of lottery or windfall for the poor or the underprivileged. The one and a half million uninsured citizens of Georgia are also citizens of the United States and have put tax money into that system. States do not have the right to tell people who have worked all their lives that they cannot receive benefits for something they've contributed back to. Many of the uninsured and the non-insured are low-wage earners who cannot afford health care coverage, and it is callous political leadership that would deny health care coverage to the most vulnerable populations of this state. We hear much rhetoric concerning the economic viability of Georgia. And if that is really the case, then the governor must realize that part of stimulating economic growth and a strong workforce depends on having healthy human beings. Economic growth is not about theory and formulas. It is about human potential, and all humans will not be economically viable if they are not healthy. Only those wealthy among us can sustain themselves economically without being healthy. Catch that. Only the wealthy, not the rich, but the wealthy. But the vast majority of Georgians are not wealthy. And it is the governor's responsibility, and our responsibility as legislators, policymakers, all those standing with me, to make sure that all Georgians have access to quality health care and remain healthy to make our economy stronger. Thank you. Welcome to questions. Well, I just ask. Um, the governor made comments today in his egg, in this uh, eggs and issues breakfast. Some of the reasons why he didn't accept the expansion, the state basically can't afford it after they get the federal money. What are you, what's your response to that? I think well, first of all, the federal government is going to pay 97 percent in the first three years, and then after that, for the next seven years, for for 10 years, the federal government is going to pay 90 percent of that cost. And so that cost is minimal to the cost it would be if you had to have uninsured people going to emergency rooms or people getting sick and their, their prognosis develops to a point that it's uncurable or by the time it's treatable, it is about 200% um, of what it would have cost if you had done preventative health care. Well, we do have two resident health experts who are going to chime right in. Thank you. You see, the basis for the expansion of the Medicaid program was not to keep it as status quo in any state, is to change the argument away from medical care and hospital care to creating what we call healthy communities. And for those people who the cost of care in the long run would be reduced so that there would be monies, because we all know that where the budget is going now, would it be sustainable? if we were to keep up with the same pace of treating people in the most highly cost divisions? Absolutely not. So that when you have the opportunity, number one, to treat people in a setting with lower cost to keep them more healthier, and you create those communities, for example, uninsured veterans, this would uh, target that population. It would target families, which now are not targeted. But when you keep a family healthy, the cost of care 10 years from now would be less than what we're paying for 29% of the population 
that we use that are not those of nursing homes disabled or blind. So that is why the expansion of Medicaid is not keeping with the status quo, but keeping with the policies where we need to go to keep people healthier so that the cost of care in the long term, let alone the three years, but the seven years added to that would be reduced. Any more questions? Yeah, Ma'am, um, first, congratulations on your, your election. Uh, Thank you. How much do you, do you feel that Medicaid expansion is tied into the current debate on the Medicaid provider fee? There's some concern uh, or some talk among some Democrats that I've spoken to that that they should go hand in hand, that maybe uh, that they won't vote for the provider fee if there's not some give on Medicaid expansion. Is that an issue for you all? Do you all tie these together at all? They're two different dichotomies. You can tie it together because they have one common word called health care. The health care provider fee is one option on how you fund Medicaid patients within hospitals. And it's based on the fact that there are many hospitals, because remember, not just the Medicaid expansion, but the Health Care Affordability Act is going to change the way disproportionately high indigent charity care facilities receive money. So. In Georgia a few years ago, we patterned ourselves behind what we've been doing for a while with nursing homes. But nursing homes are primarily proprietary institutions under the hospital bed tax, which in our state, most of the hospitals are not for profit. The governor said at that time, Governor Purdue, let's look at the amount of indigent charity care each hospital is providing it's based on the methodology. And for those hospitals that are disproportionate, such as Grady Hospital, we will give more money to them to offset what be the loss in the funds for Medicaid. So is it one against the other? It's a different concept. It's more, I think, status quo. But in the where it was at that time, it helped offset some of the indigent charity care. I think it's our duty to look at all the policies concerning how we fund health care and medical care to the population of the nine billions of Georgia. That's just one aspect. I don't think they have to be against each other. They just have to be um, diligently reviewed and make a determination as what's best for the nine million people here because at any time any of us could be affected by being sick and preventive care is always less costly and that's not what the hospital bed tax addresses. Thank you ma'am. Any more questions? Yes, sir. One of the reasons that, as I understand it, Grady's uh, budget's got a giant hole because of its, uh, its indigent care and emergency services is because other hospitals uh, in the ring out, outside of the perimeter tend to go on uh, diversion. Uh, basically, they push their emergency uh, car accidents or whatnot integrating yes. fast. Um, they, declare dec they declare a state of diversion uh, easily. Um, and I don't know if there's a mechanism uh, <laughs> to force them to take patients so that Grady isn't. Um, and as long as we're talking about whatever might be on the table, how, how will you address this question of Grady having to be the, the, the last resort every time, and as a result, the, the recipient of all of this expense all of the time. How do you push these expenses into other hospitals? If I might, I'm, I'm definitely not a health care expert, but it's in place already because for those that don't, that don't have a high Medicaid rate, it, it does cost them some money. So it's certainly an incentive to do more, and then you won't be because the, the, the majority goes to our trauma centers that take in a lot of Medicaid and uninsured people. And so those that take in only the well-to-do and those that's doing well, you're just helping out a little with your folk that get caught and need trauma in a hurry. You're paying for it. Because if, you go, if you've got trauma in this area, you want to go to Gray. As well as the trauma network, because for many, many years, Grady was the level one trauma center within 100 miles. In doing that, when Grady had too many patients and went on diversion, everyone went on diversion. We're all in agreement with that, right? Yeah. Uh, so specifically to address your question, it would mean 
that in the rules for the trauma care, when you have now um, a mechanism for having level one, two, and three trauma centers, we have to have that discussion on what are the parameters of diversion, which hospitals, who then supplants that, what level of care so that we can continue to keep a continuum of care for people who are in trauma, um, accidents, um, injuries on the job, our police officers, but we cannot cherry pick those that go to which trauma center so that we can level that out through, I believe, um, rules that specifically address at what times and under what circumstances diversion is appropriate into home. Thank you. This concludes our press conference. And again, we urge the governor, Governor Dill, to accept the federal government dollars so that he can expand Medicaid coverage in Georgia so that all Georgians will have access to quality, affordable health care. Thank you.